So today it is a pleasure to present to you this talk by Peter Lee on Rojak, how a salad represents everything about Singapore. So let me do a, a, an introduction of Peter. I'm sure Peter is known to multiple persons in the audience, uh, but I should do um, a, a proper introduction. So Peter Lee is an independent researcher and honorary curator of the NUS Baba Museum, a museum that is managed by the National University of Singapore. He co-authored The Straits Chinese House, published by the National Museum of Singapore. He produced Junk to Jewels, The Things That Peranakans Value, an exhibition and catalog for the Peranakan Museum, uh, which is part of the National Heritage Board. He co-curated -co Sarong Kabaya at the same museum and wrote a book on the subject, which was shortlisted for the Singapore History Prize. Peter organized an exhibition, Family Portraits from the NUS Museum Straits Chinese Collection, and published its catalog. He co-curated Singapore, Sarong Kabaya, and Style at two major museums in Japan. He was a guest curator of Port Cities, Multicultural Emporiums of Asia, 1500 to 1900 at the ACM, and co-authored its exhibition catalog. He was a consultant for a Peranakan theme film at Changi Airport. Peter was also curator of Amik Gamba, Peranakans and Photography at the Peranakan Museum. In 2020, The Mark of Empire, a four-part documentary in which Peter features as a series host, was broadcast regionally by the channel News Asia and uploaded on YouTube. I'm sure everyone is, has been eagerly awaiting this talk. Afterward, there will be a question and answer session that will be moderated by Michael. So Peter, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Georg. Thank you to Dr. Go Georg Yen and Dr. Michael Yeo and NTU Cluster for this invitation. Um, I thought today to share a kind of a light conversation um, on kind of a Singapore. So it's, it's a bit of a Roja presentation as well, which is very much in, in keeping with today's theme. But um, I like the idea of, well, you know, the melting pot and the Roja and, and how we, you know, basically have inherited this very ancient history of uh, Roja culture. And uh, basically it's something we should be very proud of. Um, oops, how do I? Um, I, I'm basically looking at, at, at it from the angle, cultural angle of order and disorder, and how we need to kind of embrace this uncertainty and diversity when we think of culture rather than in terms of neat borders of, of, of you know, clearly demarcated zones. Uh, and the best way to think about this is through, in Singapore, is through food and popular culture. And the amazing way that, you know, food is indiscriminate, it is viral, it is porous. Uh, there are multi-directional influences. Uh, food is oblivious to boundaries. It is oblivious to appropriation as it has always been for hundreds of years. Yeah, through food, we can also see the organic way that ideas circulate among people and how we connect. Um, the tensions come about only when food becomes the emblem of identity, nationality, and the you know, problems arising from claiming ownership rights, politics, and racism. I'd like to uh, bring us back to, to kind of uh, the spirit of food. So, of course, food and sharing, and the word companion, which comes from two Latin words, com, with, and panis, bread. So uh, companionship or friendship is uh, rooted in the idea of breaking bread together, which I think is such a lovely, lovely idea. And just messing around with the ideas of, of words uh, related to bread, we have, of course, the Portuguese pão, uh, and they brought the first Western, kind, Western style bread to uh, Asia. And through that, we have the Kristang pang, and we get pang sushi, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Uh, Japanese pan, and of those of you who remember Yaohan, it, uh, when it first opened in Plaza Singapura, we had the first 
taste of anpan, the, the sort of a, a red bean bread. And of course, any, nowadays, any of us watching Korean series will hear the word pang, bread. So this is all from the Portuguese. However, interestingly, the Chinese pao, uh, I've checked the etymology, apparently it's totally not related, but how funny that it sounds so close. And then of course, through Tamil, we have uh, roti, appam, putu, chapati, and prata, and all the funny versions of it. Uh, you know, in Hokkien, what, uh, loti, chak loti, tek loti, uh, we've added it to Singapore, Cantonese, and Hokkien. And of course, when uh, appam in Pranakans, we have uh, appam bakwa, the appam with the sauce. And uh, putu, we have putu piring and uh, all that kind of stuff. So this is also integrated uh, and just from one simple idea of food. Um, I like to think of Singapore and that as, as the heir to a long line of port cities. And that when it was founded in 1819, we had all this people coming from the region, bringing with them, you know, uh, a very old heritage of things being mixed up in a very indefinite and imprecise way, rather random kind of mixing up. And, and we, it, it was sort of not a new culture. It was a really old culture that's been around Southeast Asia for centuries and centuries. Um, I love this picture by Jan Brandes, who was a, a Lutheran minister in Batavia in um, I think about from 17, 1790 yeah, to 85, he, he, he lived in a, in a beautiful house. And this is an illustration of his son, Yancha. Uh, I have a detail of him on the right. And just the way he is dressed, I think, expresses this idea of the mixed up. He is wearing inside this Hokkien or Chinese style apron called an oto, which ended up being worn by every child across you know, all communities in Batavia and uh, in the Malay archipelago. Uh, quite often, the, the, the child would not wear any underwear, so it would be facilitate the ease in sort of, uh, you know, passing motion, passing urine. And, uh, but he's got over it uh, a sort of Western-style coat. And, uh, but if you just look around the details of what's in the house, it's this wonderful rojak of elements. So right in the foreground, you will see the bantal with a carpet probably from India, but under it, a woven tikka or mat. And if you look at the close-up on the right, you see behind, I mean, that's uh, probably how the family slept just on the floor. So you see the, the tikka guling, the, the mat that's rolled up, and inside, of course, this something which we have even up today in every, probably in most houses in Singapore, the bantal guling or bantal pulok, or the bolster or Dutch wife, as it's sometimes called, uh, wrapped under, you know, rolled inside it. And, uh, you know, if you look around the furniture, the pots, and the tabletop has a little teapot. Could that be a yixing teapot from China? A, a, a sort of brassware on the floor. Some of it looks very from uh, made in the Nusantara style, and some of it by perhaps uh, European metalsmiths or Chinese metalsmiths. I mean, you had so many craftspeople from all over the world in Batavia in the 18th century. And then, of course, uh, this very charming group of uh, parrots and uh, exotic birds. I just, I, I, I believe Jan Brandes uh, kind of uh, did a Photoshop of the floor. I'm sure it would have been just full of poop. Uh, and then, but, and then interestingly behind, uh, Flora, who was their slave, uh, who came, I, I think she was from, from Eastern Indonesia, uh, and she is spinning uh, some yarn on a jantra, or uh, what also, also call um, rahat in Malay. Uh, the interesting thing is jantra and kapas, uh, words that come from Sanskrit, uh, the, the spinning wheel, and kapas cotton, also from Sanskrit. So, uh, you know, the, the, the very old world and the very old hybrid world still was very much alive in, in, in 18th, the 18th century Batavia. Uh, this I just uh, illustrate uh, a Puranakan oto made of a patchwork of kain pelikat or pulikat cloth, this sort of check cloth. The, the interesting thing is we call it kain pelikat after pulikat in South 
India. But uh, probably a lot of, of the, the, the fragments you see here were made in Manchester or something, you know, because um, um, they were much cheaper from, from Europe at that time. So even here, we have this Roja patchwork in an auto. Um, I love this other illustration by Jan Brandes because, you know, this is a, a Chinese funeral ceremony or ancestral remembrance ceremony, but just observe how uh, the table of offerings has um, Western style chairs beside it. And I mean, it looks to me like a, a white sort of linen or cotton tablecloth, which is also very European style. Uh, and then before them, they, you know, the, the people observing the ceremony are also have laid out this carpet, which uh, in all likelihood was, uh, would have been from India. So again, by the 18th century, life was already so lovely, mixed up in a lovely way. Um, I draw your attention to this picture from the Chan family, uh, Baba Nonya Heritage in Malacca, uh, the funeral of Chan Cheng Siu, dated 1919. Now, if you look, I mean, at first glance, it might seem uh, completely traditional. We have a very typical Southern style uh, set up with what we call the Kim Tong Gyok Lee or Jin Tong Yu Nui, Golden Youth and Jade Maiden, the Heavenly Acolytes uh, behind. And then as well as what they call the Tok Tao Kan or Chua To, I forget how you read that, Tian maybe, or Child at the Head of the Altar Table. So... Uh, but all that's very traditional. But actually, if you look at the, at the table top, you will see that there are a pair of, uh, instead of Chinese lamps, we have what we call, the French call photophores, uh, which is sort of a French style storm light to hurricane lamp. And then instead of an, a Chinese incense burner, it looks to me like a silver trophy that's been used here instead that might have been purchased from Robinson's or or something. So um, already you see this uh, lovely mix of things and how people randomly just selected whatever they fancied to um, include in something so traditional. I, I love this picture belonging to my friend Arthur of, uh, anyway, it's from a, one of their ancestors of the Lin family, uh, from collection of Alice, the late Alice Chu, but this is so the funeral of Hu uh, Chiao Tong Tiong of Penang. And so instead of the Kim Tiong Yok Lee, what do we have? But or the Tok Tao Khan, we have these metal American butlers uh, to flanking the altar. And uh, you know, it's just interesting how different families just randomly picked uh, whatever item in these very modern art deco, you know, racist actually now if you think about it nowadays, uh, kind of uh, figurines to stand in for, for, for something very traditional Chinese. Um, I love this picture of a group of Malay dignitaries. Um, I've not been able to find anyone studying this, but uh, uh, you will see two of the gentlemen holding up some kind of a contract or statement or some legal paper. And um, I don't know whether this could be some, some sort of royal family or something anyway, um, but the way they are dressed, um, you know, uh, I have a paper on, on fashion and dressing in the 19th century and nobody kept to any fixed style. It was so random. So you see the central figure is wearing what we call a sort of a drill cotton suit or budget tuto uh, with Western shoes. He's got on these fancy goggles and sun, or sunglasses. Um, and if you see, if you look around there, people just dressed in an assortment of shoes, footwear and jackets. Behind you will see even um, one of the retainers wearing a Chinese style tailored Chinese style jacket, but made from kind pelakat. So, um, you know, there was no sense of trying to be uniform the way our communities nowadays, the, the modern style is to, to dress in uniform, all in the same color, uh, in very fixed styles. But when we go back to the 19th century, we see this incredible freedom in how people put themselves together and you didn't have to look the same at all. I mean, this sort of uh, wearing of uniforms is a very Western idea of what fashion is. And I love, love, love this picture I recently found in my collection. It's of, uh, well, a very tourist shot of uh, two snake charmers. 
uh, there's some pretty creepy things going on in the front, which I actually don't want to get into at this point. What I want to draw your attention to is uh, to the, the spectators at the back. And if you look, everybody is wearing a different kind of hat, which I think is so fascinating uh, from, you know, fair style hats to straw bolters to cowboy hats and bowler hats uh, and sort of even a bucket hat. And nobody's wearing the same kind of hat. It's just amazing. And, and uh, it has that kind of spontaneous feeling that these people just were just walking on the street and they just came together and seeing what this uh, Western tourist was doing, you know, snapping a picture of uh, these snake charmers. But talking about the creepy thing, if you look in front, there's this funny thing of, with, uh, I don't know, chicken feathers or something. Or is it, are, are those like, no, no, they're leaves actually. Or was it chicken feathers? I can't really tell. This sort of funny uh, symbol here with sticks, I don't know, and a kind of voodoo looking doll and some bells or, I don't know. Anyway, there's some really weird things going on here. But, um, uh, and then of course, um, I have to sell Baba House a little bit today. We have, um, thanks to uh, uh, one of the members of the Friends of the Museum, he spotted that, he, he's pointed out to us that, uh, you know, what we call the Tian Si, which is this uh, ornamental decoration sort of technique um, where you put, uh, you snap off bits of porcelain or earthenware and create these uh, sort of uh, stucco decorations. But the word for te is made from broken up Dutch gin bottles, uh, which I thought was um, so amazing. Um, and you know, what is more roja than uh, Singapore streetscape where you have, you know, uh, terraces, rows of terrace houses where each house is, you know, completely different. And when we look at uh, the, the submissions for uh, building plans, um, you know, people were submitting all kinds of facades. So there, there didn't seem to be any strict rule like in Europe where, uh, you know, the design had to conform, you know, it was, it was much, much stricter. There was a lot of freedom in Singapore and you could have a sort of Malay style, Indian style, Chinese style, or everything thrown in together and nobody would actually, I mean, it would pass. Uh, and so we have this amazing cityscape of uh, you know, very mixed up architecture in Singapore. Um, I love, I, I've been collecting textile labels and these from Huttenbach Brothers and Dietham also express this wonderful uh, idea of the mixed up uh, in terms of the script. So for the one for the Dietham and company, we see Tamil, we see Thai, Jawi Malay and uh, Chinese as well as English. And this was made in, uh, a printer in, 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 in England for um, specifically for the Straits market and including Penang. But anyway, let's start with looking at Roja itself. Um, well, I call this, it's an old Javanese chop fest. Firstly, uh, if you go and if Wikipedia and all the entrance, entries on Roja, you will see uh, references to something called the Tajigunung inscription from 901. But I've asked my guru, Ibu Dr. Hedi Hinsler from uh, the Netherlands, who has kindly reported back to me that there is not a single reference to the word Roja in any of the Tajigunung inscriptions. So apparently there are three dated, one dated 1910, uh, 910, sorry, CE, one dated 1245, and some copper plates dated 901. Um, and she says there is not a single reference to the word Ruja. However, uh, the old Javanese texts are full of the word Ruja, but they are all in reference to cutting up, cutting off, carving off body parts. Uh, it was used in reference to battle scenes. So here I've thrown in a, a, a lovely carving from Chandi Prambanan of uh, somebody being Ruja up. Um, uh, yeah, oops. And, but with this interesting connection between killing and cooking, so there's this wonderful, wonderful paper by Dr. I had to go on the YouTube to learn how to pronounce Yuri Yakel, I think, uh, by Dr. Yuri Yakel, uh, who wrote this paper on warriors killed and sliced as cucumber. 
And uh, I, I have a screenshot of this particular passage from the Bharata Yuda, which is sort of the uh, a version of the Mahabharata. And it is, it, it's um, the, the, the passage concerning the, the, the murder or the, the killing of Abhimanyu, the, uh, yeah, the son of uh, Arjuna, is it right? Anyway, so here he is, body is crushed as finely as the leaf of beetle and he's cut to shreds as delicately as sliced cucumber and mashed. Um, not speaking Javanese, but I, I love to see that the word chinacha sounds like chinchang, how we use that in cooking as well. And of course, we can see chin, chin, the last line, chinacha alindi sahantimun inantan. Sahantimun, uh, sutimun, I recognize timun. So uh, anyway, there is this wonderful thing in, in Javanese literature where uh, chopping up somebody and cooking, cooking terminology, sort of a merges together, you know, it's used as metaphor and symbol. But out of interest also, I, I checked some old dictionaries and Winston tell, tells me that uh, something called the anak ruja or the puruja is actually the pestle for pounding betel nut. And mar to maroja is to pound betel nut. And this is particular to the Malay spoken in Penang and Perak. Uh, and there, it's sort of, a, I think, a, a kind of term that's fairly obsolete today. Um, but anyway, this wonderful connection between roja pounding, which we see, you know, when we make roja, you see it being made, the, the, it's, the, you see a pestle as well, and that, that kind of earthenware dish with grooves. And, um, you know, so there is this link to a mortar and pestle as well. And of course, to slicing up. So at some point, I, it perhaps uh, reference the, the, the slicing of all this unripe fruit and, uh, or, you know, uh, that was... Um, constituted a, a, a roja. Uh, just a little bit about Java and Singapore, of course. <clears throat> Java is very much part of the whole Malay archipelago, right from when we think of the cultures from, uh, you know, the ancient period from Sri Vijaya, we have Majapahit. Uh, Javanese culture, you know, high culture was very much part of the entire region. And even right up to uh, when Malacca fell, so many of the Portuguese reported that the majority of the Malays in Malacca were in fact uh, Javanese. And we see that too in uh, the uh, rules and regulations and even the titles because so many of the Sultanate titles from Malacca at the time uh, reference Java. Uh, the use of Pati, Adipati, of course that comes from Sanskrit as well, but it's Sanskrit via Java. Um, uh, and things like that. So there, there was already a very strong Javanese presence in the Malay world. And of course, we have a very old, uh, we have a Javanese community in Singapore that's been here since it was founded. And of course, we have a Kampung Java. And adding to that, we've had a lot of Pranakans uh, from Java who are now part of our Pranakan community here. Uh, many of them came from, I mean, they could come from Sukabumi and in various towns, of the North Coast from Juana, Rembang. Of course, we have Batavi, Batawi uh, Pranakans in Singapore as well, but now they're all just, you know, it's all this mixed up thing. And of course, uh, the Baba Malay spoken has several key words that are not used in, in Peninsular Malay. So for example, Chankil for Chawan, for a bowl. Uh, even today, we Pranakans lo love to use the word Mbo Mbo to mean, I mean, Mbo is mother in Javanese, uh, the more common word known in Singapore is mba, but mbo, mbo we don't use in terms of for mother, but just any old nonya, you know, so old bb, all the old, all the mbo, mbo. Of course, we use the word kapiting instead of uh, ketam for prawn, kodok instead of uh, katak for, for frog, and the ear we say kuping, and of course, the hairpin we call the korek kuping or the ear, ear digger, and also certain very Javanese terms like wak wak uh, as a term of address for an older lady, uh, very, very much, very common among uh, Pranakans. And of course, uh, we also love eating buah keluar, which uh, uh, we don't see so much in uh, Peninsular Malay menus. Uh, and this is also very Javanese. Um, looking back to how we find the word roja, we see at the top right shops in Penang, a reference to a Malay uh, food place uh, a food 
like a little restaurant uh, and uh, to Malay Rojak shops in Penang, 1911. But uh, below and to the right, we see two advertisements referencing uh, in Rojak Batavia. One sold by the YMCA. And interestingly, if you look at the menu on the left, dated 1929, you have, you have mutton chops and Rojak Batavia all served all at once and kormas as well. Um, you know, food and menus were already so mixed up in those days. And to the right, the Kichap Batavia or the Indonesian style Kichap. Uh, it, it says there below, paling uh, sedap buat dimasa sama rojak, bikin rojak. So it's, you know, really good and tasty for making rojak. Uh, and this was imported by a Chinese import-export company called Lim and Company. And it's a lion brand, um, possibly a Chinese made kejap that was brought in. And uh, I looked at John Crawford's dictionary. There doesn't seem to be any reference to Rojak in 1852. Um, but uh, then we see, interestingly, uh, this full range of uh, you know, multicultural Rojak. So we have uh, this thing about penjaja, which actually means colonizer, but I'm quite sure in this reference, it's in this context, it's, it's meaning uh, migrants. So uh, penjaja China, penjaja, he says, Tionghua, Penjaja, Chinese hawkers. Uh, anyway, this is a reference to Penjaja Kling, uh, Tamil hawkers who sell Roja. Uh, then below, uh, next to it, we have something about an article about the Roja man who is Chinese and about the makers of what we call Heiko, or in, in Indonesia, they call Petis, which is that uh, prawn paste. So in this case, uh, they are you know, it became a multicultural industry. So obviously there were people from all kinds of backgrounds going to the beaches to make this kind of uh, ingredient so essential to Roja. Um, I have here a page from the Kitab Masak Masakan India dated 1845. And again, it shows you this wonderful mixture of food from everywhere. So drawing your attention, something called Lalawa, but uh, which probably sounds more Javanese, but they have here a Balinese version. We go, look down further, the great lapis. We have lapis ingris, lapis Portuguese. So it's a Portuguese lapis cake, ingris, English cake. Then something called below under M, Makanan Fransman, and, and you something European. And further down, we see Masa Ayam Chara Salam. So it's that kind of uh, cooked chicken uh, in a Muslim style. But below that is Masa Babi Seperti Orang Cina. So, uh, cooking pork in the Chinese style. Uh, and then further down under N, we see nasi kabuli. So kabuli is Kabul, of course, Afghan style rice, which Pranakans we eat, we call it nasi kamuli. Uh, it's with this sort of nasi minyak, uh, pilaf rice sort of thing. And then if you see the top, a very old recipe for nasi ulam lion rupa. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, below that as well. So different kinds of ulam recipes, also suggesting that Menus were varied and there were all kinds of different types of even one dish. Um, and we see right under R below, a very typical Javanese dish, rawon. Interesting, uh, none of the rawon recipes in this book has any reference to buakalot. I mean, now we know rawon to be uh, this Javanese dish which uses buakalot, but here, none at all. Uh, like to draw yourself, uh, draw attention to the, what we call a very traditional Puranakan dish, hati babi bungkus. But you know, it is baked. Baking is just not Chinese at all. And we eat it with a pickle uh, where we use uh, Coleman's mustard, you know. And when we, I was in Yorkshire and, and you know, in, a, in a little sort of a butcher shop and I was really shocked to see this thing that looked like hati babi bungkus. And so, you know, they are the hati babi bungkus is basically a faggot, which is, uh, you know, a, a meatball wrapped in coal fat. It's exactly the same technique. So, you know, here we are thinking and so proud of this very quintessentially Pranakan dish. And it turns out it's not at all Pranakan. Um, and also, you know, I, I, we, what we, we see very commonly is, you know, this sort of semantic diffusion, like one term, but 
it doesn't really, not that it means a different thing. It all refers to cake, but the, the recipes are so totally different. So top left, we have what we call in the Philippines, bibinka, which is a rice cake. And it's got, uh, it's got crafts, craft cheddar cheese shredded on the top of it. <laughs> and uh, various versions, what we know as kue binka. And bottom left, we have binka ambon, which is ambon style bin, uh, binka. But interestingly, it doesn't come from Ambon at all. This uh, Binka Ambon is a specialty of Medan in Sumatra. And then we have a uh, bottom right, what we call Bibinka, which is made in Goa. And what they have is in fact, what we call like a Kue Lapis. So, you know, uh, it's interesting how the, the terminology spreads all over the Indian Ocean and the archipelago, but the actual cake itself is not the same. Uh, we see this also with Kue Bangkit. Um, this gave me the most terrible sore throat over Chinese New Year. Um, but the word Bangkit is known in Batavia as a, a kind of a, a little a cookie. And so I found a recipe for it in the same book. It is basically flour, sugar, and it just says uh, minyak. So it's not, not uh, I think, just fat. So it's not butter. Uh, so it's not a butter cookie. It's a you know, animal fat cookie with uh, sugar and whatever. But the, the kue banquet, as you know, it, uh, we, we use um, tapioca flour for it. So uh, the way it is made is completely different, but the name survives. It's an old word for a Dutch cookie. Um, then we come to a very old Pranakan word, pansit. Um, it's in our Baba Malay dictionary. It's sort of fairly obsolete now, but it literally was the old way Pranakans called the wantan. But going to the, the oldest Chinese dictionary in a European language, we have this amazing uh, find from, uh, in Manila, which is in the Universidad de Santo Tomas. Uh, and this, it's been um, reprinted by the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. Anyway, there I went hunting high and low and I had to ask a Spanish friend how you say dumpling in, in, in cause it's a Spanish Chinese and it's, well, dumpling is empanadas. So as you can see, the second entry, empanadas is called pancit, exactly how we Pranakan say it. So we've kept this very old uh, Chinese word, actually. And I've looked up the Kangxi Tzijian and things like that. Uh, Chinese, uh, no, Tzihai, sorry, not Kangxi Tzijian. The Tzihai also has pian shi as a very old word for wantan. Uh, but just, it's amusing to see the other terms here, bak pao and chai kue, which uh, is a vegetable, dumpling, but uh, it's fascinating to think that in, so this would have represented the Hokkien spoken in Manila about seven, in the sort of first half of the 17th century. And um, anyway, and also representing this shift, semantic shift. Uh, it, now there's only one kind of pancit in, in the Philippines that is a wantan called the pancit molo. Every other kind of pancit is actually a bihun or a tanghun or something. So the, the, the meaning has completely shifted from the original. Uh, then we have this very issue with kue bahulu, which is considered uh, traditional among Malays and Peranakans in Eurasian. But of course, it, it comes from the Portuguese and it's more uh, something from the Eurasian heritage, just by the way it is cooked. Uh, the, you know, this kind of egg and flour and on that kind of griddle is uh, not Asian at all. It's basically like a madeleine. And, uh, you know, but, you know, everybody, it sort of claims it as, as, as something, you know, we all put labels, Pranakan, Kue Bolu, Malay, Kue Bahulu. But when we think about it, it, it comprises two words, both meaning cake in different languages. So Kue is from the Hokkien word for cake, and Bahulu is from Malay Bolu, uh, from, is from Portuguese Bolu, both meaning quake, cake. So this cake that we consider so traditional among Eurasians, Pranakans and Malays is actually... Uh, you know, comprises two words meaning cake cake. Uh, and we see this also the something we consider so quintessentially delicious and Malay that we always eat when we go to a stall is uh, the burgadel. But lo and behold, it is a kind of a, it's basically a, a, a North European croquette called a fricadel, fricadel. And we see the fricadel recipes in, in these old books. Um, and the idea of mashing potatoes, anyway, potatoes from the new world, etc. So it's sort of a very hybrid thing. 
Uh, come to Kaya, we see at the same kind of a, everybody claiming Kaya to be their own. We have Nonia Kaya. Uh, but, you know, when we look back to the ingredients, uh, it, we, we go back to Portu Portugal, we go back to Goa, maybe to convents and egg whites. So why convents? There is a legend, and this is an, a Wikipedia legend, so it's, it tends to be corrected, but the theory goes that uh, the nuns used a lot of uh, egg white to starch uh, ecclesiastical clothing and you know, things for, for the altar and what the priests wore. And there was a lot of le leftover egg yolk. And that's how uh, so many Portuguese desserts end up using egg, egg, uh, egg yolk. And we see here also um, a recipe for Ketan Sirikaya or Pulot Sirikaya with the, with the glutinous rice. And the method is exactly the same as today. Uh, the term, however, talking about this sort of mishmash, um, could be, I mean, I, and the goddess related to the goddess Lakshmi, uh, Sirikaya is one of the epithets of uh, Lakshmi. And of course, a very old connection between Lakshmi and Southeast Asia. For example, this 10th century Gaja Lakshmi or Elephant Lakshmi, at Bantia Sri Temple from the 10th century. Kaya, apparently the word itself, meaning wealth, uh, comes from Persian, apparently. Um, so here I just run through everybody uh, sort of claiming Kaya to be their own, Hainanese Kaya, Malay traditional Kaya, Malaysian Kaya, Thai Kaya. Of course, in Thailand, it's called Sang Kaya, but as you know, uh, Sang and Sri were adapted already in the Sri Vijaya period uh, to, as an honorific. So Sang Nila Utama, for example, Sri Vijaya uh, as a kind of honorific. So Sang Sri interchangeable. So in Thailand, it's Sang Kaya, uh, Indonesian Sri Kaya. And of course, we also have uh, Portuguese Sri Kaya. If you go to any cafe in Portugal, in Lisbon, um, it's claimed as a very traditional thing coming from Goa. But the, the Portuguese version, of course, is much more like a souffle, uh, eggy souffle, yeah? and it's, it's sort of uh, fluffy and, you know, it's also the specialty of a certain part of uh, Portugal called Alentejo, and you eat it with these stewed prunes. Uh, and it looks nothing like our surikaya. But of course, through the New World, through Portugal and Spain, it spread to to Central America, and here we have something called the jericaya, which is something you eat uh, in, in Mexico from the Guadalajara region. Uh, and through that, it's spread to other parts of Central America. So we see this version called the chiricaya. But what is interesting, uh, the Central American versions are much closer to our version. Uh, they are steamed in a bain-marie, so they're, you know, like our, our, our kind of kaya, which is steam. And that makes sense because um, baking, uh, it was, you know, is not something we, we, um, uh, that was easy to do effect in, in Southeast Asia. Steaming was so much easier. And, you know, because of the galleon trade, the amount of uh, Southeast Asians traveling over to uh, America is yet another story to be told. Um, in terms of kaya and my family, I'd like to share with you uh, the, our, our recipe came from um, a grand aunt of mine called Ninik Salat, on, called Ninik Lat. That's her with my father as a boy in 1931. She was born in China, sold as a slave uh, to Singapore. Apparently, she was promised that she would be a concubine, but she got cheated and she ended up just being the servant. So, you know, very embarrassed. Uh, with this story, but uh, my father grew up with uh, an uncle, actually. So she was from my uncle, uh, a granduncle's household. Um, and that's her on the right with me. She, uh, you know, kind of a sad story. When she, when she died, my father had a problem uh, putting a name because she had no name. She just had a nickname. She was just known as Nenek Salat. And of those of you who know uh, Malay or Kian, Salat is the old name for Singapore. It's from the Straits, you know, Straits of Singapore, Salat, Singapore, but Salat meant Singapore. So she was grandmother Singapore. And uh, my father had to think of, a he had to make up a name for her on, on, on her tombstone. Um, the recipe was passed from Nenek to my uh, Amache, 
Deep Jing Sin, who was born in Canton. Um, she died not so long ago at the age of 100 something. And I had a lovely thing I wrote about her uh, for Biblio Asia about the Amas, all Amas, black and white, so called, of Singapore. Uh, and the recipe was finally passed down to our current chef, Alona Alejandrino. So from a China orphan to a Cantonese Amache to a Filipino chef from Ilocos. Um, and this is our version. You squeeze the coconut milk out, you mix in the egg. You have to use a sieve, um, just like in that old 1845 recipe. You, you, you can't uh, mix the egg directly. Uh, this is mainly to break up all the, the um, to break up the um, stringy bits of the egg white. Um, then you add the sugar and you sieve it one more time to, to make it super fine. Um, throw in some pandan leaves, put it in a steamer, bain marie, stir it non-stop for I don't know how many hours. Um, then when it starts to set, cover it. And you must use a good morning towel. Uh, and the reason for that is to make sure that the condensation doesn't drop and disfigure your, your kaya. Um, there, then you have, when you lift it up, you have this very smooth surface, not, not pitted like, a, like the surface of the moon. And here, our version, we, we, we serve it like a, a, a thick slice of custard or jelly or something. You know, we can, you know, my mother, you know, if, if, you, if you give her one of those pureed versions, she will like roll her eyes. So uh, we have to slice it off like this. And uh, to us, this is the perfect color, perfect texture of a uh, kaya. Of course, eaten with a whole lot of butter. And the worst, most unhealthy kind of uh, gardenia white bread. So, you know, Nowadays, we, we, we look at food and the way it's going. I mean, food really represents the sort of organic nature where how we in, get influenced culturally and how we, we get inspired by things. You know, global food culture is about appropriation. You know, and therefore we have the Hawaiian pizza, we have the California sushi, teriyaki burger, roti john, Chinese stalls selling nasi lemak, Malay stalls selling chicken rice. It's it's where things are the most free, uh, you know, the, the kind of cultural freedom we see in, in food is so amazing. We see it all in Singapore. But, you know, but why is it becoming such a, a subject of a disagreement? And, you know, we, we go back to this. I'm sure you all remember when Rio Ferdinand, the famous footballer, came and, you know, nasi goreng lunch. I mean, as, as I, you know, the Javanese culture is very much part of Singapore culture. And why is all this sort of like a jealousy coming up, you know? Um, then, of course, uh, my dear sister Violet Woon, you know, was uh, roasted online <laughs> with uh, daring to, to, to kind of appropriate nasi ambeng. Poor Violet. Um, I, you know, uh, well, to, honestly, to me, why can't you have Javanese dim sum? I mean, why not, uh, you know, buak lot dim sum or whatever, you know, I mean, I think it really shows the sort of exuberance. And um, anyway, I love the way that, 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 that there's a kind of free for all, that, that there was a free for all in food. Um, and now, you know, it's all about um, back to barriers and, you know, being PC. And so, you know, we really, I think the Roja and its many iterations really celebrate how we, we, we share a lot of, of, our, of our heritage and um, um, we should just embrace and, 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 and not care. I mean, what, you know, uh, and, and worry less about labels, but celebrate that we can um, be inspired by what everyone else is cooking. And that's why the food scene is here is getting food here. Food scene here is getting so interesting. Um, then you know, on on the negative side of things, we have uh, where roja is used in terms of something being mixed up, but not in a positive way. You know, roja has now this negative connotation of being, you know, 
badly put together, you know, just thrown together, you know, in a, in a kind of a hodgepodge. So we have here from the newspapers a comment made by um, then Minister Lim Sui Se, where he spoke about, uh, I think in reference to, to a, you know, the potential of the opposition coming to power, you would have a Rojak, coming, a Rojak government coming up with the Rojak policies. And the government would be a big bowl of Rojak, but isn't a bowl of Rojak the most wonderful thing to have? I don't know. So it, it, it sort of didn't hit the spot as a negative term for me. So although the term suggests chaos and disorder, it is time to rehabilitate and celebrate the Rojak in culture as something creative, entrepreneurial, and egalitarian. With a long history in the region going back to the classical period, the conceptual Rojak is therefore both utterly Singaporean and Southeast Asian. Um, I'd like to close now with looking at, uh, just for fun, Rojak in terms of musical history in Singapore. And the, uh, I forgot to mention, but uh, this photo uh, is uh, from the collection of my friend G.T. Lai. Uh, his, I, I simply love it. It's a Peranakan Hawaiian band. How crazy is that? And uh, but our musical tastes have been so varied and mixed up. My father wrote a, a little book about growing up and he referenced that my grandfather uh, could play the violin and he would play Stephen Foster songs. And as you know, Stephen Foster was a composer in the sort of mid 19th century and it was all sort of um, about the old South. And uh, here is this Baba Puranakan, um, knowing all his tunes, it was pop, pop, the, the pop music of Singapore, uh, circa 1900. And uh, what did my father grow up? Hollywood songs. So we have here, for example, and, and, and just old, you, you know, English tunes. So. Crazy Pranakans for you. And on the other one, you see my father with his old Raffles College classmate, uh, my late father, uh, with a classmate, uh, uh, Chong Lai Wa, who is still alive at, at 100. Um, and it's them singing together. It's springtime in the Rockies. I'll be coming back to you. Little sweetheart of the mountain with your morning eyes so blue. Once, Once again, again I say I love you. When the, when the birds sing all the day. When it's springtime in the Rockies, in the Rockies far away. So, you know, this is a movie starring Betty Grable and John Payne with Carmen Miranda back in the 40s. And uh, that's the music, the traditional music we grew up with. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we, we listened only to the Andrew sisters. My father, you know, we could sing by mere bis du shame, which um, is apparently Yiddish or something. And uh, we didn't even know what it meant, but we, we knew it so well that we started miming to the Andrew sisters. And my crazy mother uh, made us, you know, do sort of drag as children. I mean, which I wouldn't, if I had kids, I wouldn't let them do this. <laughs> but, you know, I have a, this amazing mother who let us wear all her dresses and uh, we could sing the whole Andrew Sisters album. I mean, for those of you who don't know Andrew Sisters, the Andrew Sisters were a big uh, a trio uh, in the 1940s and were sort of the big, very popular during the war and all that. So, and here we were in the 70s and, you know, we can still sing everything from the Andrew Sisters repertoire. Uh, we do it without the dresses these days though. Um, I'd like to end with also what was traditional music for our family. And this is, um, if you indulge me, to I'll play this uh, with myself and my three brothers singing a cappella in 2014. Uh, traditional Pranakan tune. <laughs> Oh, 
So I end with a, a little statement here. When can we proudly say we have no fixed identity or that we have multiple identities or like a rojak, we are all a mix up of many delectable bits. Thank you very much. <laughs> 